Hey gang, it's Brian from FX Billiards. Today we're going to talk about secondary breaks, or you may call them re-breaks, or you may not even have a name for it. What we're talking about when we talk about secondary breaks, whoever broke, whether it's you or some other person, managed to make it a legal break. So they got three balls to the rail. APA, you have to get three balls to the rail. They managed to get three balls to the rail, but also at the same time managed not to break the balls up very well. The first thing that you have to do when looking at a secondary break, number one, are you someone who runs racks? If you've never run a rack in your life, if your average run is two balls, let's say you're a relative beginner, that's okay. You're probably accustomed to making one, maybe two balls at a time. If you don't run racks, it does not benefit you to have the ball spread out. Number two, if you're someone who is sandbagging, then <laughs> having the ball spread out is going to reduce the number of innings in the game, whether you win or lose. We definitely don't encourage sandbagging, but it is so prevalent these days in the APA. The third reason is that there's something going on with that cluster that is a negative, that is a negative for you, and you want your opponent to be the one to break it up. If you're not going to be able to break the balls up, and make a shot that's going to get you on another shot, there is absolutely no reason to do it. I a bad break usually occurs when you see something like this. You've got a breaker who manages to hit the balls, manages to get three balls to the rail, and at the same time, left all of these balls clustered up. So a lot of these patterns are going to be very familiar to straight pool players. As a straight pool player, you do this constantly. You're always looking for angles, either for your break shot or to re-break balls or to break up clusters and things like that. A lot of times when you have balls that are in a situation like this, a lot of eight ball players, unfortunately, will make the wrong decision on their next shot. So let's look at what we should actually do here. A lot of players will play that one ball thinking they're gonna get on that three and that's gonna be a good thing. And it's not a terrible idea, but Looking at this, we know if we play the stripes, we can shoot a stop shot here, and this back cut on the 14 not only takes us into the cluster, but it allows us to make contact most likely with the 10, 15, 13 situation, which is going to spread those balls out and give us a chance to run out. So the shots would look like this. We shoot a stop shot on the 9, And now we have just an angle that will take us into that 10 ball, so that's our target. Remember when you're breaking up clusters, whether it's something huge like this or a two ball cluster that might be anywhere on the table, have a plan. Don't just try to hit the cluster. You wanna know which ball in the cluster you wanna hit, how fast you wanna hit it, and in which direction. You may not hit it that way all the time, but you should have a plan. We're looking to hit that 10 ball. So we're gonna get down on the 14. We hit the 10 and you can see good things happened here. Now, we actually do not have a shot on that 13 right now. We don't have a shot on the 10. We do have a shot on the 12, but what has happened is we've freed up some of our balls and we can look actually for another secondary break. So the first thing we're going to do is just shoot this 12 in the side. Not an easy shot, but we pulled it off. And now you can see we have a shot on the 13. So what do you do here? You definitely don't want to take the low balls. You take the low balls, you got one shot. That one shot does not put you on anything that is going to break up the cluster. But if you take high balls, you actually have a number of opportunities with the striped balls. So let's look at each of them. And there's actually four different lessons in this cluster. Lesson number one, if you have a decent draw shot, you could play the 11 and draw into the cluster. I only recommend this if you can get decent speed on your draw shot. Number two, play the nine in the side, get shape on the 12 in the side, and come into the cluster that way. That's a second way that you could go about doing this. You could, 
This is one of my favorites. Look into the rack. Always look into the rack, guys. 1015 is dead end almost. It's got a slight angle. On this table, it's going to rattle in that pocket. But if you watch my videos, you know that if we come over here and make contact with this ball on this side, we can actually throw it into that corner pocket. So if we hit the 10 on this side with, with low enough speed, we can throw the 15, which is frozen to that ball, into the corner pocket. A third thing you could do is a combination of what we just talked about. You could play the, the 9 and the side, get shape on the 12 to play the 12, 10, 15 combination and do all kinds of damage to that cluster. The other thing that I really like, and, and this takes a lot of thought and a lot of experience sometimes, is to give yourself multiple opportunities. What do I mean by that? I could put myself in a way that would allow me to have a shot on that 13, which would help break up the cluster off the 11, get on the 10 and or get on the 12 in the side, which will allow me to break up the cluster. You know, I don't care who you are, okay? Shane, you're not gonna come always within two and a half inches of where you think you're gonna land. So give yourself multiple opportunities to be in the right place. If that 10-15 is your preferred cluster break, put yourself in a position where you have a shot at it, but if it doesn't go well, you still have a shot at your insurance shot. In this case, either the 13 or the 12. So let's see what happens. So if we put ourselves right here on a stop shot, we have a shot now on the 13 in that corner pocket and on the 10, 15. So let's see how that works. We're just going to shoot it with a stop shot here. Why? Because that'll put us on the 11. It's not rocket science, guys. So what are you shooting here? The solid balls, right? What are you gonna shoot? You can shoot the six after shooting the seven, which might give you a nice angle to break up this. You got choice, right? It's after the break. You could play the five and get right here, exactly there, and shoot this shot here on the one ball. Or you could play the high balls, the stripes, and really do some damage. I like to do damage. So this is what I'm going to do. We're going to play the 11 and get ourselves on this 9. Now this 9 doesn't go anywhere except in that side pocket, but we're going to play the combination because one of the things you should always be doing when the balls are this clustered up is look for dead shots. Look for what I like to call wired balls. The 15 goes straight into that corner off the 12 ball which means if I make contact with the 14, the four, the six, the nine, not only does it send the 15 into that pocket, but it does some damage. It breaks things up in a way that I can run out. The other thing that you need to look at is what happens to the eight while I'm doing all this damage. You don't wanna break up the cluster and find the eight ball rolling into the side pocket. So we know that if we come in here on the nine, this chain of events here is gonna send the 15 to that pocket. We'll actually call that shot. And in the meantime, the eight is gonna be relatively, not totally, but relatively um, safe. We're not gonna to have to worry about making the um, eight ball by mistake. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw this back a little bit so we have a nice angle on that nine. And now, all we have to do is shoot the nine into the six and watch the 15 go into the corner pocket. Sometimes our rebreak is not going to be as obvious as balls that are dead for the pocket. The 11-14 does not go. 
But if we pay attention here, the 10, 13, has a tangent line that goes directly towards that pocket. If we hit the 10 with the right speed, don't put too much backspin on it and throw it out of our line, we have a chance here to shoot a re-break, getting that 10 and 13 out of the stack and putting one of them in the pocket. If we really get fancy, we have an opportunity to not only make the 10, but break up this cluster at the same time. So you have a choice. Do you wanna get the 15 out of the way first before you do all of this magic? We could do it that way, or you could play the nine, the 12, and then get on the 10 to work it out that way. So I'm gonna show you this way first. We're gonna come around to get shape on the 10, 13. And now we can see the 10, 13, and guess what we have also, guys? An insurance shot. If I didn't get this perfect position here, I could play the 12 on my next shot and yet let the 12 get me on the 10, 13. But because I got here, I'm actually, I'm going to shoot it now and I'm gonna get greedy and work to break up that cluster at the same time. Some of you may see that this is not a bad idea to fix in the meantime, but I'm looking at these as insurance shots in case I don't have a shot after playing the 10. So you see, we played the 10, we broke up that cluster, we broke up that cluster, we got all our balls out here, we could even shoot a combination shot here and, and not be that out of line. And the last thing that we're gonna to need to do at some point, actually not the last, but sooner than later, is get our eight ball out of this mess. While we're doing all of these great re-breaks, secondary breaks, however you wanna classify them, one of the things you have to keep in mind is you wanna have a good idea what is going to happen to those balls. Now, chances are you're not gonna spread out the entire rack, the balls are gonna be all over the place and you get to run out. Chances are you're gonna to get to pick off three or four of your balls before you play a nice safety or leave him tied up or something, whatever the case. But you wanna make sure that bad things don't happen to you just because you're excited about having a re-break. Here, our hero has given himself the seven in the side which allows him to go into the clusters, but he gets down on the shot and then this happens. That is what we call an early eight. You have to pay attention to what's going on down there. You're not just looking to break up the rack. You're looking to break up the rack in a manner that makes sense. Just like you're looking for wired balls that allow you to spread everything out, to make some combinations and things like that, always be conscious of where that eight ball is. And of course, obviously, if it's sitting in the pocket, be even more conscious of it because that is a terrible way to lose a game like this. Last thing I wanna show you is that you're not always going to be coming from a traditional direction when you are breaking up these clusters. You may be coming from behind the rack, off a rail. Uh, you might have a ball that's sitting in the side and you're over here and you can come into the rack that way. There's a lot of different things you can do. But this is actually one of my favorite ways to break up the clusters if I can. If I shoot the one ball here and put myself behind the cluster like this, I can use a ball like the five to get into the cluster and break these up with very little chance of accidentally making that eight ball. So that would look like this. It's amazing how many expressions that have been coined for, for um, pool uh, just really are stupid. And one of them is you, you're play the, you play the table, you don't play the player. Um, well, the reality is, yes, you gotta play the player because you got players that can't do certain things, can't shoot jump shots, can't kick, can't draw the ball the length of the table, can't shoot long shots. You play that guy a lot different than you would Shane, right? If you don't, you, you're what we call a, a racker, professional racker. So what you have to do is decide whether or not it is worthwhile 
to break up these clusters or to let your opponent do it. Now, one of the tips I can give you is if you are a relative beginner, don't do this because bad things are going to happen, especially if you're playing a higher ranked player. Don't get impatient and just spread the balls out even if you have one of these shots to shoot at. The other thing is if you are playing against someone that totally outclass you, I don't care if you're a four or a five and you're playing a seven, and seven, there's a big gap in the APA. Eight ball, there's, there's, there's a seven here and there's a seven here. You're playing a high seven and you do this, it is a bad idea. You want to stretch out the games when you're playing someone who outclass you. Have a great day. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit me in the comments and I will talk to you soon.